Hello, Crossing Church. How are you doing? Are you doing okay? Hey, you're going to notice uh, some changes uh, uh, that are going to be happening over the next few weeks uh, because we're in the process of uh, moving to high definition. That's kind of exciting. And uh, uh, you won't see it right away at uh, some of our locations. There'll be little subtle changes, but it'll, be key, it'll keep getting better. And uh, I'm just thankful that we have that opportunity to uh, catch up with uh, the 20th century and the 21st. Okay, so that's pretty cool. And uh, we're in the last of a series of sermons called Not a Fan. And if you've been here for all of these uh, sermons, it's been uh, uh, something that really works you over. How about that, Hannibal? G- Kirksville uh, worked you over, huh? Pittsfield 929 uh, worked you over, Macomb. I know it did. It's been working me over. If you've been listening and you've been involving yourself uh, in uh, the, uh, the teaching, I'll tell you, it's, it's really something that's a gut check for all of us. Where are we when it comes to being a fan or a follower? And I think what we're going to find out is that way too often we're fans when we need to be followers. This is the last in that series, and I really want to paint a portrait of where we are. You know, when when, uh, Luke 9.23 is said, Jesus is getting ready to point himself toward Jerusalem. Now, that would not be necessarily a big deal because Jesus was in Jerusalem multiple times. But this time when he points himself to Jerusalem, it's for the last time. Jesus is on his way to the cross, and he knows it. You know, when we talk about being a follower of Jesus Christ, we need to recognize that that's where that road goes. Did we, do we ever think of that? That if I'm going to be called a follower of Jesus Christ, I can look in God's word and I can see where that road goes. It goes to the cross, doesn't it? It goes to a tomb. It goes to an empty tomb. And ultimately, it goes to the gates of heaven and a glorious return. But we need to recognize to be a follower of Christ is going to follow him down those roads. And those roads are not always easy roads. So we need to understand as we kind of crack open the things that I want us to understand today... We need to understand the context of it. Jesus is focused. He has his mind set, and he is going to move to Jerusalem. And there is a change that is palpable. It's noticeable in the Word of God when it gets to these latter chapters of uh, the book of Luke, a change in the demeanor of Jesus when he gets his mind set to Jerusalem and he's determined to go there and fulfill his mission. And uh, just the, uh, uh, the, the, the way that he uh, describes himself and the way he speaks to people, uh, his demeanor, it all changes as he starts on that process. And where we're going to be today in Luke chapter 9, I know we're in the same chapter as the scripture that we've been drilling down on for a number of weeks, the 23rd verse, Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. I want us to see what happens later in that chapter. As a matter of fact, there are three scenarios that happen right next to each other, three conversations, very short conversations that Jesus has with three separate individuals. And uh, we're going to look at those three conversations because it has to do with this last piece of not a fan, and that is to follow Jesus, right? When we're talking about Luke 9, 23, it says, if anyone would come after me, and we drill down on that, we know what anyone means, right? Anyone means anyone, and anyone means everyone, and everyone means who? Means you, means me. Would come after me, let him deny himself. We talked about what it means to live in denial, self-denial. Take up his cross daily. We talked about what the cross is, a symbol of suffering and humiliation and ultimately death. And the last part of that verse, the 23rd verse is, and follow me. What does it mean to follow Jesus? As Jesus walks this road for the last time to Jerusalem, to his death, I want us to understand what it means to be a follower, to follow him. 
we're going to see these three scenarios, and they're going to come from Luke 9, verse 57 to 62. And I'm going to break them up into three uh, parts because there's three little conversations, and I want those to be applied to your life and to mine today. So let's look at verse 57, Luke 9, 57. It says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. That's our first little conversation. Someone just says to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Those are some pretty impressive words, aren't they? Wow. Hey, choose me. I want to go with you. I will follow you, and there are no limits on me following you. I will follow you wherever you go. You know how flippant that is? I mean, we say that, and and this guy says that, this impressive statement, but it's actually a very ignorant one. Does this guy have any idea what he's saying? Where is Jesus going? Well, he's going to the cross. He's going to his death. I will follow you wherever you go. Listen to the ignorance of the statement. He has no idea what he's saying. He has no idea what that statement entails. And you know something? You and I, we have no idea what it means really to follow Jesus. I am so thankful that we can't tell the future. What would it be like if we could tell the future? I mean, some of you uh, have probably been through a really hard week this week. And if you knew what was coming this week and knew that you couldn't do anything to change it, how would it make you feel? Man, I'm kind of glad we don't know what's coming in front of us. But we have to be careful when we say statements like that. I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus' response is an interesting one. Because we make general statements, and general statements are easy, but specific statements are a lot harder. Maybe we'll make that general statement. Maybe you made that general statement when you accepted Christ. I'll do whatever. I'll just do whatever. But is that what you really meant? Specific statements are better. Because what Jesus does is he shows this person who speaks to him exactly what that looks like. In his response, what do you hear? The foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. What he's telling this guy is wherever, if you follow me wherever, that means that you're going to be homeless because I'm homeless. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm homeless. And that's nothing compared to where he's going. I mean, being homeless is one thing. Being crucified is another one. And he doesn't even bother telling this guy about being crucified. He just says, homeless, will you really follow me wherever I go? Because that means if you're going to follow this rabbi, it means that you're going to be homeless. You're going to live without any place to call home. When Jesus is calling you and Jesus is calling me, we don't know where that road's going to take us. I talked a few weeks ago about what Henry Blackaby calls the crisis of belief. That we come to these forks in the road and we know that one way is very well defined because we've been down that road before. The thing is, it's circular and it just leads us right back to where we were. And then there's another way that we don't know, that he's calling us down. And that way is a scary way because we have no idea what's down that road. The fact of the matter is, when you follow Jesus Christ, you don't have any idea where that road's going to lead you. You have to trust him to lead you down that road and to not leave you or forsake you. Because if he takes you down that road and leaves you, you're going to be lost. If he takes you down that road and forsakes you, you're, going to be, you're not going to know your way back. See, if you go the other way, you'll know your way back. But the other way is the way that you depend on yourself, and the way that Jesus is leading you is the way that you depend on him. Does that make sense? So when you say wherever you go, you don't really know what that means. And this guy had no idea what it means. You know, they had an old saying in uh, ancient Israel. 
if you followed a rabbi. And that saying was this, may you be covered in his dust. May you be covered in his dust. You know, when we follow Christ, we're covered in something. But it's not dust. It's blood. When we are the followers of Jesus Christ, we are covered in his blood. So no matter where we go, no matter where he leads us, no matter what the circumstance is, he'll be there. Because he's not just in you. He's all over you. So maybe we can't say, I'll follow you wherever you go. But you may say to the Lord, here I am. Here I am. Does he know what he's looking at when he looks at you? Does he understand all your inconsistencies? Does he know all of the things about you that are messed up? And hypocritical. We just need to be that child that holds on to the hand of our master. And let him lead and trust him to take us to the places that he knows are best. Wherever. The second scenario is the third one in the list in Luke. I want to go to that one second. It starts in verse 61, and this is what it says. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? I mean, what's the big deal about just going home and saying, hey, I'm going to follow this rabbi I'll see you later. Well, there was probably more to it than that. I mean, he probably wanted, you know, some time to, to have a going away party and, and, and to, to pull a bunch of people in. There was probably a lot more to it, but we really don't need to drill that far down. What Jesus says in his response is very important for us to understand. It's not just wherever, I will follow you wherever, It's, I will follow you whatever. In this particular circumstance or situation, Jesus is saying, come on right now. There's no waiting. There's no holding off. You need to to come right now. And you don't need to be looking backwards. You need to be looking forwards. He uses an illustration, a farming illustration. No one puts his hand to the plow and looks backwards. Now, farmers understand what that means. And when farmers plow a field, uh, of course, now they do it with GPS and everything else. I think you can even let go of the steering wheel now on some of these tractors. But it used to be that when a farmer was plowing a field with a tractor, he would pick out like a fence post on the far side of that field. And he would aim that tractor at that fence post. He'd keep his eyes right there on that particular target, and he would go straight at it. Now, why is that important? Well, so that you can have a straight row. You see, if you spend a lot of time looking down and seeing what's happening down right around you and in front of you, and you don't keep your eyes focused in the right place, that tractor's going to wander. And if you do a little, a little wander like this, by the time you get to the other end of the field, do you know what that little wander is going to look like? It's going to be like that. And it's going to be a really hard field to manage all the way to harvest. So you want to you plow a straight row. So everybody knows that, even going back to ancient times. That's how you plow a field. And, and Jesus is saying, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks backwards. If you look backwards, how in the world are you going to plant a straight row? Think about Jesus in his own life. At this point, he's got his mind and his eyes and his heart set on Jerusalem, right? He's going straight to Jerusalem and he's going to die there for the sins of the world. You see, what happens so often is we end up turning to the right or to the left. And Jesus is telling us that we have to keep our eyes on the prize. You know, sometimes we want to hold things back, don't we? 
thinking about backwards. We want to hold things back. We want to keep things from God. We want, we want Jesus to be Lord of a number of things in our life, just not everything in our lives. Do you know the Knights Templar, and this is back during the Middle Ages, the Knights Templar, when they were baptized into their knighthood, they were actually immersed into their knighthood, and they were immersed in full armor. But when they did it, they would always hold their sword in the air so that when they were baptized in the water, immersed in the water, their sword would stay out of the water. So like when they went out killing and their sword was bloodied with their enemies, with their enemies, the death of their enemies, that they were giving all of them to the, to the Lord with the exception of their sword. I wonder what we hold out of the water. That's why I tell you that illustration. What are you and I holding out of the water? If we were being immersed in the water, what would be the one thing that was in your hand that you wanted to keep out of the water? Like, you can have all of this, God. Everything that I'm putting under the water, you can have that. You just can't have this thing I'm holding out of the water. I wonder what that might be. Because what Jesus is saying is when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, there is no looking back. You know, I dated a lot before uh, I end up, ended up uh, being engaged and then married to my wife. What would it be like if I just reconnected with one of those old girlfriends and I just started texting, you know, and seeing how things were going? And uh, my wife picks up my phone and goes, uh, Who is the. Uh, Oh, yeah, you know who that is. That's that girl that I used to date, you know? And we thought we were going to get married, and, and, and we even named kids. You remember? I told you about her. And you're texting her. Oh, yeah, yeah, she was such a nice gal. And, uh, I don't think that would play well in the Harris home. Let me tell you. Because no one puts their hand to the plow and looks backwards. Those relationships are back there. They're history. And I'm in this relationship now. We can't be holding things out of the water as we're giving ourselves to the Lord. So it's got to be whatever. You know, I've done a number of, lots and lots of funerals. And I've done funerals for people that I, I know and have been related to and love dearly. And I've done lots of funerals for people I didn't know. So-and-so has a, has a relative that passed away and they needed someone to do the funeral. And I've done hundreds of those. And so I don't personally know the person who died. So it's hard for me to be able to eulogize them or to build a funeral service around them since I don't know them. So I'll call the family in and we'll sit around a table and I'll start to ask them questions so that I can familiarize myself with the person. And then when I give the message about Jesus, I can use them and their life as an illustration of that message. That's how I do it. Now, I'll tell you, when I sit them down, this is what I'll say. Would you tell me like what the most important things were to this person? And I've heard all sorts of things. Beer, motorcycles, bowling, gardening, flowers, birds, walking, fill in the blank. I've heard so many things, but do you know what is extremely rare for me to hear? Very rare for me to have a family come in and say, let me tell you about this person. There was nothing more important to them than their relationship with Jesus Christ. Out of every hundred, I'd have to say I've heard that less than five. What does that mean? It means we have a lot of fans and a shortage of followers. Now, when it comes to dying and funerals, well, everybody wants to hear that they went to heaven, right? Everybody wants to have the joy and the peace that flows from an eternal destiny of bliss. But is their life a reflection of that desire? Or is their life different than that? Scenario two is whatever. 
I will follow Jesus, whatever. I won't, it's not about going back home. It's not about let's have a party and everybody say goodbye to each other. It's fixing my eyes on, my eyes on Jesus and moving forward. Wherever and whatever. That's what a follower is. Last scenario. And it's the one in the middle, and I, I chose that for a reason. It's in verse 59, and it says, And he said to another, Follow me. So now Jesus is actually inviting someone else to follow him. And he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Now this one is even more severe. What's interesting about this is that when I first read this, it seems that Jesus is being unreasonable. And I don't know about you, uh, but that's, that's how it hits me at, at, at first glance. It's like, you're not even going to let this guy go back and bury his father? Well, you're making a big assumption here. And the big assumption is that the father's dead. And a closer look at this scripture reveals that the father isn't dead. But what he wants to do is wait for his father to die. And after his father dies, then he'll go and follow Jesus. Because right now, he feels an allegiance to his own father as opposed to having that allegiance to Christ. It's interesting also in this scenario that Jesus calls him. The other two are reaching out to Jesus. Here, Jesus is actually reaching out to this other person. What's, it, what's this guy actually doing? He's, he's living in the world of tomorrow is what he's doing. He's living in the world of tomorrow. And ultimately, the majority of the people that are listening to me right now, you live in that world. You live in the world of tomorrow. Well, another way to put it is you live in the world of putting off things for today. <laughs> in the world of procrastination. The world of tomorrow is that world that where you say you'll get it done. A little bit later, give me a little bit more time. I just don't really feel like it now. i got to be in the mood for that. I'll get it done. I wonder how many people right now at the various crossing locations have said things like this. I know that I need to be baptized. One of these days I'm going to do that. I wonder why Jesus made baptism the way he made it. You know, it's hard to be baptized and not get wet. It's hard to be baptized and not lose your hairstyle. It's hard to be baptized and not look like a drowned rat when you come up out of the water. It's, it's hard to be baptized and not go through the inconvenience of wet clothes or having to change wet clothes. It's hard to be baptized and to know that other people are going to see you that way. It's hard to be baptized when you're scared of water. It's hard to be baptized when you're scared of crowds. Oh, there's all sorts of reasons. So why, do you, why wouldn't Jesus make it easier? Why wouldn't Jesus make it a lot easier? Why do we push the whole immersion thing anyway? Well, that's because that's what the Bible says. First of all, there's no reference anywhere in the Bible to sprinkling, just immersion. Well, why can't, the, the, the sprinkling is so much easier. You just get a little wet. You just, you know, you just wipe it off. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, sprinkling is a great, great thing for a fan. Isn't it? Put a little face paint on, yell for your team. Getting immersed? Wow. That's going a little crazy, isn't it? And yet we put it off. We put it off. I know I need to do that. One of these days I'll do that. You know, we do that acting like we know about tomorrow. But we don't know about tomorrow. You don't know anything about tomorrow. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you this about tomorrow. It'll have its own day full of issues That'll make it easy for you to put that tomorrow off to the next tomorrow. 
right? Every tomorrow has got a full calendar. Every tomorrow has got a full plate of things. Some of them, and a lot of them, you don't know, you don't have any clue about, and it could change everything in your life. It could change everything in your life. And these decisions that would be easier made today would be very difficult for tomorrow. You know, we have an idea of what tomorrow is, but it is not right at all. I, I remember going to Disney World and, uh, and Disneyland. They both had Tomorrowland. And uh, that was where, that's where Space Mountain used to be and uh, Disney World. And uh, the Matterhorn, I think, I think was, at, uh, was at Disneyland. And you could go into Tomorrowland. And I remember General Electric had a thing that you could go in and, and they would show you what they thought tomorrow looked like in the 50s. Like in the 1950s when they were trying to sell you products, this is going to be what tomorrow is. Boy, were they off. Have you ever watched those sci-fi things? And they like, and the date that they're talking about that's in the future, that's how you know you're old, was when you're watching sci-fi movies about the future and it was like 20 years ago. And you remember then. And this is what they thought it was going to look like. And it's not at all what they thought. You have no idea what tomorrow looks like. I have no idea what tomorrow looks like. So when Jesus calls us, he calls us now. He calls us immediately. He doesn't call us to put it off. When my parents die, I will follow you. When I get these other things settled in my life, then I'll follow you. When I get all these things wrapped up neatly and tied with a bow, then I'll follow you. Jesus says, now. And as a matter of fact, back in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22, when he called the fishermen, he uses two different, uh, one word and one phrase when he called them. It says, at once they followed him, and then a few verses later, it says, immediately they followed him. They didn't wait. It was at once and immediately. When Peter was preaching in the book of Acts early on, he said these words, now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. There is no point in putting things off when today is the day that Jesus Christ is calling us. And you know, as I'm talking about that, it reminds me how easy it is to assess the cost of following. Because we think about, well, if I follow Jesus now, all of these things would happen and it's just not convenient. We never assess the cost of not following. When was the last time you assessed the cost of not following? Kyle Eidelman finishes his book. And this is the book, by the way, not a fan that we've been working through in these last six weeks with a pretty sobering story about a funeral that he did. It was a 17-year-old girl named Brittany Bevins. She died in a car accident. And Kyle was the one responsible for conducting her funeral. And he had that same kind of conversation with the family that pastors normally have around a table. And the parents of Brittany brought uh, Kyle her prayer journal because she was a committed believer at 17 and she would write daily. And the day she died, this is what she wrote in her journal. You hold the only peace that can fill the deepest hole. But how do I get it? You said, ask and you shall receive. I'm asking and I know that you will give it to me. Every week you bless me so much and teach me lesson after lesson. I know that once again you are showing me your love. I can't fathom how much you feel when one of your children suffers. But I've had a glimpse of your heartache. Please fill me with your wisdom that I won't just watch others suffer, but that I'll be able to say what they need to hear. As a new week approaches, my dangerous prayer is that you'll place broken-hearted people in my path and fill me with you so that I can let your love heal their pain. Wow. She had recently opened a checking account and she'd only written one check on that checking account and it was to Compassion International to sponsor a child. 
her father, and I can't imagine how hard it would have been, stood up on the day of her funeral and eulogized her. And these were the words that he said. On the day Brittany died, it didn't matter what kind of clothes she wore. And it didn't matter who her friends were. It didn't matter where she was going to college. It didn't matter what kind of car she drove or what kind of house she lived in. It didn't matter what kind of grades she made or how many goals she scored in soccer. The only thing that mattered was that she had her faith in Christ and she knew Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Jesus calls us to follow. Wherever, whatever, and whenever. And that process of following begins with a simple decision and an action that backs up that decision. My question to you today is what is standing in between you and getting up and following Jesus Christ? We're moving to a time of decision.